I'd like to introduce Dr. Adrian Thomas, consultant radiologist and a renowned expert in the history of radiology. Adrian is going to talk through some of the fascinating facts related to radiology in World War I and also discuss some interesting objects and describe some of the key people of the time. We know X-rays were in use before the First World War, but the advent of the war meant that there was an opportunity for X-rays to be used much more widely and particularly in the context of emergency medicine. What would X-ray equipment and an X-ray tube have looked like at that time and how was it administered? There was really a major change in the X-ray tube just prior to the First World War. The earlier X-ray tubes were simple gas tubes, which is basically a simple glass bulb with electrodes on either side. You'd pass a current across it, energy would be released, some of the energy in the form of heat, other energy in the form of x-rays. These earlier tubes are fairly unpredictable because it required ionization of the gas in it and really how the tube had been used determined how it should be used. In other words, the history of the tube was important and it was a little unpredictable. It was all to change with the introduction of this, which is the Coolidge tube, which is really the basis of all modern X-ray tubes. This was patented in 1913 by William Coolidge. Basically, this is now a vacuum tube with a heavy vacuum in it. The the cathode is replaced by a spiral filament which is heated up by a current passed across it. It releases electrons, they're pulled across the tube by the potential difference and they hit the anode here. The anode is made of tungsten and apart from this Coolidge was able to make tungsten ductile. So tungsten is a difficult metal to use. He found how to make it ductile and to make it into different shapes. Here he's made the anode out of tungsten. The electrons hit that, it releases energy, releases x-rays, and obviously some of the tungsten is vaporized, which is why this hemisphere of the tube is slightly dark because of the tungsten. I mean, it looks a very fragile object. Was that how it would appear in the field, or is it protected or cased in some way? By 1914, this would have been covered by a thick lead glass casing to protect people. Now, to form the x-rays, we need a high voltage across it, so there's an electrical equipment and generators required. Um, how complex was that and how easy was it to take that sort of technology to the battlefield? The technology was difficult both on the battlefield and in hospitals. Whilst there was some form of relatively primitive radiation protection of these tubes, the electrical protection was really non-existent. In our modern sense, you basically have, you can screw on the rio pore or the wires for the cathode on this side with the uh, with, with, with the filament the current heating the filament, also on this side as well. But this comes straight down often from the ceiling or from spring-loaded spring -loaded holders. Therefore, when the tube is being activated, if you actually touch this, you would be electrocuted. That's 70, 80,000 volts. 80,000 volts, absolutely. The importance was to actually show the presence of foreign material in the wound, which would show if there was there, that they would need to be removed. It wasn't there, you wouldn't need to explore the wound, and that was important. This is looking for foreign objects, shrapnel. Bullets, shrapnel and bullets, etc. yes. And the X-ray equipment was used both within field hospitals, but also in a mobile way for the first time, perhaps, moving around battlefields and areas. How was that achieved? Basically, what you could do is have the X-ray in the back of a car or an ambulance and move that around the field hospitals. Here is quite a nice example of a cigarette card showing the X-ray ambulance these became increasingly sophisticated. Uh, the French would have them often in the back of small vans, the English in the back of back of lorries. And they would be specifically built and Specifically out. built or used, used for x-ray work. You've got a 1916 journal here with some images showing the use of x-rays. What, what's going on there? Yes, this is the, the war budget. Now, many magazines produced in the First World War to let the people at home know what was happening. This is called the wizardry of the x-rays, how the radiograph tracks down bits of frightfulness. And whilst when we look at these older images, you may say that it looks really primitive, at the time this was high, technolo high technology medicine. You see a soldier lying down and the radiologist looking with a fluorescent screen at the patient to see for the foreign body. And again, the patient standing up and again, the radiologist very close to the patient using a fluorescent screen. 
And I think part of the dangers this time was the radiologist was then in the direct beam of the X-ray tube, often then using an object such as this with a cryptoscope. Cryptoscope means looking for the hidden. And that's what we can see in the... This is what you're seeing on that image there. The cryptoscope was designed in the 1890s. It's basically a simple fluorescent screen which is hooded, an area to look at, and you could then have your X-ray tube, your patient, and then you'd look at this at the patient. Surprisingly, this sort of equipment survived into the, in, in, into the 1950s. And that was material. the key point, to find out if there was foreign material and to give a guidance to where the surgeon needs to, to look for. Absolutely. Otherwise, they would be going in blind, effect. Going in blind and with, with no idea of, of the depth. You've got some copies of X-ray images here that would have been developed um, on site and lots of these are related to the military injuries. Is there anything you can show us and, and point to here? These are examples of paper prints of, of, of injuries. X-rays could be taken in a variety of ways. You could put them onto photographic glass, you can put them onto X-ray film, such as cellulose nitrate, or you could put them onto paper. Prior to the First World War, there was a great use of photographic glass, and as you might know, photographic glass came from Belgium, and Belgium was obviously very much involved in the First World War. So photographic glass became very much less available and therefore either paper or film was much more used. These are examples of injuries and I think there's a considerable poignancy of actually holding original radiographs from the time of, of injuries. In this case you can see the upper arm or humerus which is shattered by a by a rifle round. Okay. Here, example of a lower arm with multiple fragments. And that this is, this these, is the elbow. Here. This, is the, this is the elbow here. Here's the humerus, and these are multiple fragments of shrapnel. And again, here is the upper part of the chest, the clavicle, and here's a large mass of, of, of a large lump of shrapnel. And in fact, it was actually shrapnel that killed most people, resulted in most injuries from artillery. We sort of tend to think that it's the machine guns that cause most injuries. In fact, it was shrapnel that caused most injuries and artillery that caused, caused most deaths, with foreign material being left in people which needed to be removed. Their battle dress was often contaminated with soil. When the injury took place, both the shrapnel went in and the foreign material went in, but also parts of battle dress or soil. Yeah. And this was very, quite, quite serious. These are days before antibiotics, mm -hmm. uh, and so one get very commonly get wound infections, extremely common, including gas gangrene, which was particularly feared. Radiology was obviously quite advanced then, really, in the way you describe. I think what's interesting about the First World War is really how it changed the relationship between radiologists and other doctors. Obviously, prior to the First World War, radiology was of relatively low status compared to other medical disciplines such as medicine or surgery. So, for example, Florence Stoney, who was a radiologist at the Royal Free Hospital, she was relatively unique. Here she is, Florence Ada. Stoney, whom I think is a quite a remarkable woman. She's in military dress there. In military dress, absolutely. She qualified as a doctor in 1895, which was the year the x-rays were discovered. She started radiology at the Royal Free Hospital in 1902 and also worked at the Elizabeth Gareth Anderson Hospital. She was Irish by birth. Obviously, in those days, you couldn't train as a doctor in Ireland, so she came to London and trained as a doctor at the London School of Medicine for Women, which was associated with the Royal Free Hospital. Florence Stoney presented herself to the War Office in 1914. By this time, she'd had about 13 years of experience as a radiologist. She was experienced as a radiologist. She met Frederick Treves, Sir Frederick Treves, uh, of the Elephant Man fame, who also took the King's appendix out, and he refused because she was a woman and thought she was not, not acceptable for her to go and work on the Western Front or to work as a radiologist. I love her line when she says, all opportunities should be made available for women. If the opportunities are not there, they should make them for themselves. She then went out to to, to, to the Western Front with Mrs. Sinclair Stobart and an all-woman's hospital in 1914. Uh, she, went to, she went to Antwerp and actually set up, they set up a hospital in an old music hall. And in fact, they were the first hospital that was actually working. And they arrived there, in fact, before the British Army hospitals. Unfortunately, Antwerp was 
uh, attacked and fell to the Germans, and so she had to escape. And she, in fact, she escaped on a London bus, on sitting on ammunition cases. And this is a this is another cigarette another, another card. Cigarette like card. This is of old Bill or the old London bus, painted green. Uh, which was a sort of bus that Florence Stoney would have ridden on going, getting out of Antwerp. What was interesting is how incredibly well the women doctors were accepted by the soldiers. The soldiers were delighted to have women doctors and were treated really very well. The sister of Florence Stoney was Edith Stoney. What precise role did she play? She was called a mathematical physicist, which I think probably we'd now call a theoretical physicist rather than a you know, physicist doing, doing experiments. And both of the sisters were very much involved in the, in, in, in the Great War. Obviously, as the 20th century progressed, so the medical physics or the physics support you need for the army greatly increased for the um, use of, you know, for, for supporting the, the equipment. I think what's so fascinating about this, this, this sort of generation is it is different enough now doing, doing field radiography or, or running a field hospital now, but to actually do it with the primitive equipment in the, 19, in, in the Great War must have been quite astonishing. Edith Stoney supported particularly the Scottish Women's Hospital, which went to, went, went to Macedonia, and was obviously doing all the work to support that in the field. In other words, running the generators, supporting the equipment, equipment to, do, to do radiography. Were there roles synonymous to radiographers or physicists in those times, particularly in the military context? I think the concept of radiographer hadn't quite been defined at that time. There were lay assistants. The Society of Radiographers had not been formed until the 1920s, and oftentimes the doctors were often called radiographers. However, the profession of radiography was gradually being defined. What steps were taken to protect people, and how did people suffer from exposure to radiation through radiology? I think this is shown quite well in, in the story of, the, of this wristwatch. There were three radiologists who presented this wristwatch to Corporal Warwick, which were Stanley Melville, Harrison Orton, and Arnside Bruce. All of them obviously had significant radiation exposure during the First World War, particularly the large number of people being examined using your fluorescent screen trying to find foreign bodies. Arnside Bruce was also injured because of use of radium, and the use of radium had been brought in by Marion and Pierre, Pierre Curie. Bruce unfortunately died in 1921, and this was the early age of 42. This produced a huge shock in the radiological community, you know, a very well-known energetic chap who published written books dying of radiation, partly due to x-rays, partly due to radium. As a result of this, a, radi a radiation and radium committee was set up, which was under the auspices of the British Institute of Radiology. The chairman was Sidney Russ, and in fact, the other two radiologists, Stanley Melville and Orton, both served on that committee. And this was basically setting up standards for radiation. Now we know that actually you have a cumulative dose, that actually the more you get, the more it damages you. And if you rest, it doesn't get rid of the dose you have. At this time, it was felt if you had too much radiation, you were feeling a bit unwell. All you'd need to go do was actually go into the countryside, have a nice rest, have a nice holiday, recover, and then go back to work again. So you referred to the three radiologists on the inscription on the wristwatch. They were London radiologists, and you've got a book here related to... Yes, the, the, yes, the, the, yes this, this actually shows the hospital where Corporal Woolwork worked and, where, um, and where, where the three radiologists worked as well. This is from the graphic in 1915, here on the... This side here, we see the roof of the hospital with the scenes of London there and all the soldiers recovering. The King George Hospital was actually close to uh, Waterloo Railway Station. And what there was, there was actually a tunnel between the hospital and Waterloo Station so that actually boat trains who come from the coast bringing casualties could be come out of Waterloo and then go through the tunnel into, in, into the hospital. The three radiologists who unfortunately died are called martyrs, radiology martyrs, and that was a term which had been used by many people. In fact, Sebastian Gilbert Scott, who was the pioneer radiologist at the Royal London Hospital, didn't like the term martyr, because you say, if you're a martyr, you sort of know what's happening to you. You're a martyr, but it's for a reason, you know why. He said you, he was almost for the expression victim. 
and that you're more a victim. You didn't actually know what was happening, why you become ill, why this happened, what was so you're more, more a victim. The names of all the various people throughout the world were collected, and in the 1930s and, 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 and a further edition later on, there was a memorial made in the garden of the uh, King George Hospital in Hamburg in Germany and for, for really the radiation martyrs throughout the world. This has names on? It had names on it. This was the first memorial was put up with names of people throughout the world and then later names were, were added and all three of our radiologists on this wristwatch were on this memorial. Of course one of the most famous pioneers of that time in terms of the field would be Marie Curie. She was an honorary member of the BIR and was a strong believer in multidisciplinary working of course. She was aware of the use of x-rays, medical uses of x-rays, although she hadn't done, done it herself and so she did several things. Firstly she tried to collect as much x-ray apparatus as possible to use in, in hospitals for examining patients. After that she Became, she, she became aware of the value of actually having x-rays in mobile units which could then be moved around to where they could be needed. So she used her influence with many of her rich friends to ask them to give, them, give her cars and vans which could be then used for, used for x-ray units. And in fact by about, I think it was about November 1914, the first of these units were being used. Uh, they called them petite curies or little curies. This is shown quite charmingly in this, in this stereo pair. So this is a stereo viewer, a stereo photographs. And if you look, you can see the back of this x-ray van with radiography. So you can see the table, the x-ray tube underneath it, uh, with often little protection around it, and then able to examine, examine over it. During the First World War, she was actually teaching young women to work as assistants to do radiography. After the war, there were many, particularly American radiologists and American doctors in Paris. She then set up teaching for these in Paris as well. This is another postcard. And actually, this is showing Marie Curie at the Edith Cavell Hospital. This actually is Marie Curie herself in a painting done by Joseph Hilpert. I think you know, she was an astonishing woman. That a lot of things we take for granted now, which they wouldn't have then. For example, a woman gets a doctorate now. We think, well, a woman getting a doctorate, well, you know, women get doctorate, what's the problem? She was the first woman in Europe to get a doctorate. Well, thanks very much, Agent. That's absolutely fascinating to hear radiology in the context of the World War I. And thanks for all your expertise and your time. Thank you.